invite you to go ahead and turn over to the book of Hebrews. We are in the last section of the book of Hebrews. This book of Hebrews is an outstanding uh, chapter, and really it's going to just get better from here, okay? It's getting better. We're going to see the last warning uh, throughout it all. We, we've seen a couple warnings throughout, but we are in Hebrews chapter 10. We are beginning in verse 19, and it is a powerful, powerful verse. I don't know if you saw last week what God was doing with, with just at the altar and, and all that he was doing. And, and I pray that he does that again. I'm praying that he will move just like he did last week and that he will continue to move and continue to overflow and continue to give you gifts beyond your measurement and what you thought you were capable of to do the impossible all for King Jesus. So and say amen. So if you have the verse, chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews, in verse 19. Now this is, this is I, I love the first three verses here. Let's look at the first three verses, and then we'll jump into some context of it all. Verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness. Everybody say boldness. I think a lot of Christians lack some boldness, and we need some boldness this morning. So Everybody say boldness one more time. There we go. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a priest over the house of God. Now, I love this because these first three verses are really... Uh, an overview of what we have been talking about. We've been talking about a lot of things the past multiple weeks. And this is now beginning a new section in the book of Hebrews. Come on, someone say amen in that. Like we were hearing shadow, shadow, shadow quite a bit, okay? Like God got our attention and we are beginning to move and we're hearing it. But now we're entering a new section. We're in, entering a... Um, a section that is to empower the Christ believer, to empower uh, what he is doing, to have boldness. You know, I say we lack boldness because I think a lot of times Christ followers, yes, we need to know when to keep our mouth shut, but we need to know when to make God's voice loud. When God is urging you to move and to say, we've got to begin to stand and do. So we need the act of boldness, the boldness of acting in the gift that he has given us. We need that boldness. I love what it says. Therefore, brethren, having boldness. You know, it didn't use when you had boldness. It's not saying when you get boldness. What is it saying? having boldness. You see, when you give your life to Christ, there is an automatic boldness that is built inside you. Some of us nurture it, and some of us push that down. Some of us hear God's voice, and instead of trying to be loud and exuberant about what God is saying and what God is doing, we shut down and we say, mm -mm, Lord, that's not me. We've got to have boldness in the opportunities that he gives us. If we always, if the church always stays quiet, we'll never see the move of God move. You ever hear of a revival that's hush, hush, don't talk about it, don't go around about it? I never have. When you hear about a revival, there's say and there's word and there's proclamation all over the place. Did you hear they're having revival? They're over here. Look at this. Look at that. You're telling them why. Because you have boldness because you see God moving. We should see God moving on a daily basis where we have the boldness to walk into H-E-B and proclaim his word when God says move. We need that boldness. But pastor, I don't have boldness. I don't, I don't have boldness. Well, if you are a Christ believer and you have given your life to Christ and you have proclaimed his na name on high, then I'm telling you today that you have boldness. It is within you. It is there. It is sitting there waiting for you to begin to operate and do what God has called us to do. But look at what it says. 
Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. It's not your doing. It's not by your blood. It's not by the lamb's blood or goat's blood or anybody else's blood. It's by the blood of Jesus Christ that you have boldness. Verse 20, it says, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. I love the veil. I don't know if y'all ever studied the veil or looked at the veil. But the veil is a beautiful thing. Do you ever realize that the veil was torn from the top to the bottom? Which means that no man could tear the veil. Because they would have had to tear it from the, t- the bottom to the top. And I don't know anybody that rips a paper from the bottom to the top. It had to have been done by Jesus Christ, our Father, our God. It was by him. And I love the fact that he didn't just roll up the veil and put it away for a little bit later. He didn't roll it up and say, I might use that. No, when the, to- when the veil tore... We now have that relationship with God. It has opened up the ability for us to communicate one-on-one with Jesus Christ. And I love that. The veil was the name given to the two curtains in the temple of Jerusalem. One of them at the entrance to the temple separated the holy place from the outer court. The other veiled the holy of holies from the holy place. The true veil that separated the worshiper from the holy of holies in heaven was Christ's body. And so when that veil was torn, it has now allowed us to have a relationship. You see, before the new covenant ever took place, there was an old covenant. We've gone over it. But there were some things that the old covenant never had. One is a relationship with God. You think today's hard? Can you imagine a life without a relationship with Jesus? Two, they didn't have full access to God. Three, they didn't have the true sonship with the Father. Four, they didn't have the full forgiveness of sins. And five, they didn't have the removal of the endless guilt that the Levitical sacrificial system produced. Can I tell you, I don't know if y'all are with me on this, but I have, some, I have done some messed up things in my past. But because of my Lord and Savior who went to the cross, I don't have to longer live that person anymore. I am a new with the new boldness. And you know a lot of things that we're seeing today is a lot of prosecution, persecution. A lot of persecution is taking place on the Christ followers. We're seeing persecution take place all around us. Accusing you of being who you were. But you are not no longer that person. You are a child of God with a new name written upon. Amen? Amen. And then you look at verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God. House of God. Present tense. Our high high priest is holy, undefiled by sin and pure. He is harmless without guilt or fraud. Undefiled, which means free from that by which the nature of a thing is deformed and debased. Separated from sinners. The high priest is separated from sinners, sinless by nature, being God and demonstrated to be God by his lifestyle with while on earth. The high priest is also made higher than the heavens, exalted above the heavens is what the word of God says. And having all these provisions and the greatness and superiority of the covenant, what should our response be? What should our response be? I think it tells us what it should be in verse 22. Would you look at it with me? Let us draw near. With a true heart, 
not a fake heart, with the messed up heart. God didn't call you to come in here to be perfect this morning. He called you to come here to give your all to him. Let us draw near with a true heart and the full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Wow. So when we look at the book of Hebrews, we must be reminded again of the audience that the writer is talking to as well. He's primarily talking to the Jews that are urging them to leave the shadow to get the substance. We have the substance. We have not just the shadow of God, but we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Trinity. We have the Godhead three in one. Some embrace it without question. Others will reject it outright. But the group that, is, that this writer is aiming at is not only the group that believed and embraced the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and the promises, but he gave our final parenthetical warning to those who were the infringed in their faith. What does that mean? They were the interested ones, but not the committed ones. They were the interested. They wanted to know a little bit more about it, but they were not the ones that were committed saying, I'm going to give my full life to you. There's a weeding of the crop that's beginning to take place. The wheat and the tares is what the word of God talks about. And if we're not careful when harvest comes, we'll just be another tear that's going to be spit out. Because we were never fully committed to the Lord. So they liked Christianity, they liked what it had to offer, but not want to lose in the process. But there's only one problem. Jesus made it very clear that there will be a price to pay in this life for embracing Christ, a price for persecution. The greater loss is in what one would lose if he or she would not receive the new covenant. Though a person after hearing the message of salvation and showed some interest would go back to Judaism, though they would have their earthly possessions and the praise of men and their, use, their useless religion, these were the temporal joys of this life. And this life could not be compared in any wise to the greater loss of all the glory to come. Jesus said that there would be a price to pay in this life for embracing Christ. Jesus also made it clear that there would be a price to pay if one did not embrace Christ in this life. And that price is eternal judgment. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 through 26, he says, then Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for the sake shall find it. Verse 26, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now before we even go on and look at the danger any further, I want us to look at the warning to respond in obedience to the opportunity that God has given the Jews and see the application given to us, you and I, today as well. With all the privilege that was given to the believers, what then was the response that the writer urged them to display before God? Did you catch the first couple words in verse 22? We have to draw near. 
Somebody say, draw near. Are you drawing near to Christ? Are you picking up your cross on a daily basis? It can be tough at times. It can feel like a ritual at times. But through every single day that you pick up your cross and you go to the word and you pick up the word, he's going to show you something new, vibrant. He's going to fill you with a new wine. He's going to fill you with a newness. Draw near. How? How do we draw near? We have to draw near with a true heart. A true heart. You know what a true heart is? Authentic. A true heart has authenticity and doesn't have two faces to it. We try to come in with an extra face upon us, and yet we go home acting a completely different way. We have to come to the Lord with a true heart, with a trueness, having our hearts sprinkled from a wicked conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Does that mean all that conscious, all that wickedness will always leave your brain? No. But what you will realize is that's who you're not anymore. There are times where God's going to allow it to disappear and dissipate and be gone. And there's times where he's going to allow it to stick because he wants it to be part of your testimony. He wants it to be part of who you are so you can go and tell others being bold for God. If you're not bold for God, you might never even tell them who you were. Because it's hard at times to tell people the wrongness of who you are. The authenticity of a true heart. Why is it so hard? One, because we live in a fallen world that's completely fake. We're afraid of what people might say or think of us. What will they say about us? What will they say behind our backs? But we don't need to focus on that. We need to focus on who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us. For we know persecution is coming. We know persecution is happening today. But what we also know is that we must take up our cross daily, daily. Verse 23, if you would read it with me, in verse 24 it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. You ever drive a vehicle and you veer off? A few days ago, my wife and I were driving and a guy was texting and he was looking down and he veered into our lane and I had to wail my horn and he finally looked up and he veered back over. I was thankful that he moved. God's giving us warnings. He's saying it's time to wake up. It's time to be bold. It's time to move. It's time to hear my voice. It's time to come to the altar with a true heart, with repentance in your heart, giving me your full conscience, giving me your full self, and watch what I do through you. And all you have to do is walk out of these doors knowing that you are now bold for Christ and knowing that you have a greater purpose than what you thought was even possible for yourself. Let us hold fast the, conscience, the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love. What do you talk about other people when they're not looking? Are you stirring up love and compassion? Or are you serving up hatred and selfishness and comparison? When we talked about when we talk about people, we need to talk about people with love and compassion, knowing that there is a greater cause within them. God tells us in the word that we all are part of the body. One might be the hand and the other one might be the other hand while we have a foot and another foot. They all look different from each other and yet they're all part of the same body. 
people are going to look different than you. They're going to sound different than you. They're going to look different than you. They're going to talk different than you. They're going to have a different type of boldness than you. And that is all okay. That doesn't mean you're in the wrong. That doesn't mean they're in the wrong. What we have to focus on is being the body of Christ, lifting each other up. I love what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one member, every one members one of another. Romans 12, 10 says, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor pre- preferring one another. Romans 12, 16 says, be of the same mind one toward another Mind not high things, but condescend it to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own con- cons- concepts. Romans 15.5 says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Like-minded. Like-minded is to be of the same mind. Example, to agree together. To cherish the same views. To be harmonious. Romans 15, 6. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. With one mind. With one mind is a very unique Greek word. Used 10 of its 12 New Testament occurrences in the book of Acts. It helps us understand the uniqueness of the Christian community. The word with one mind is a compound of two words meaning to rush along. And in unison. The image is almost musical. If the band doesn't play together and sing together. While Pastor Charity begins to sing. Or Miss Sonia or Amelia or Harmony begins to sing. And then the other person begins to sing a completely other song. And then the other person begins to sing another completely different song. It's not going to be very pretty. It's going to sound really off and really bad. And every single one of us are going to be like, what is going on? I can't worship to this. Why? Because we're not one. We have to be one as a body of Christ. One minded with one likeness. God has given us a vision of this church and to move in that vision. It's time for us to become one in one body, playing a part, playing a beautiful musical instrument where we all play a piece. It doesn't matter if it's a small piece or a large piece. God wants to use you. If you allow him, he will use you. We got to be under the direction of the master or the Holy Spirit to listen to the Holy Spirit. To blend together. Because I tell you what, not every single one of you are like my wife and I. Some of y'all are a little bit different than me and my wife. But you know what? I'd love that. Because that shows God's uniqueness in his creation with you and me. God shows how he can, he can bring together a whole group of people with different, different backgrounds, different viewpoints, different looks to reach the lost. Verse 25, it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. I'm going to ask the worship team if they would come up and prepare for the end. The principle in verse 25 carries with it the previous thought in verse 24. The place where the love and good works are to be exercised is in the assemblies with the saints, with each other. The practice of using our gifts 
What gift has God given you? I know my wife and I through many, many years, not just here, but just being in ministry in different churches in different ways that God has taken us. We've heard many excuses on why we can't get to church. I work, pastor. Well, pastor, I'm looking for a church when in fact reality is you haven't looked in two years. Well, pastor, I go to school. Sundays are my only day without my family around. Well, pastor, I, I don't drive during the day or I don't drive during the night. Maybe it's don't bother me or stop judging me. Maybe it's the excuse of I was hurt at a church so I don't go to any other church. I'm going to be really real with y'all. I pray that's okay with y'all. My wife and I have been hurt in many churches. And I hate using that term because it wasn't in churches. It was by individuals. One of the previous pastors my wife and I ever served under was stealing from the church, cheating on his wife, And one thing after another just kept coming up. I can view it as I have been hurt and I don't want to ever enter into a church again. Or I can view it in such a way that God placed us at that specific church for a specific season and for a specific reason. You see, I didn't understand it at first I didn't understand it at first why we had to go through that. Literally 10 months in, 10 months into our ministry, and we begin to see things unravel from day one. It would have been very easy for us to say, you know what, ministry, we don't want anything to do with it. We don't want anything to do with the church body. We don't want anything to do with pastoring. We want nothing to do with what God's going to do, especially if his church is like that. Many of us have been hurt by individuals that are in the church. But we don't go to church because of an individual. And I pray that you're not here today because Pastor Jacob is on and behind the pulpit. I pray that you're here today because you're ready to receive what God has for you. My father taught me at a very young age, spit the, chew the meat, spit out the bone. Chew the meat and spit out the bone. You ever get chicken in your mouth and you begin to chew and all of a sudden you get like a, a shred of cartilage and it's like, oh, oh. And then you even question if you ever want to eat chicken again? Uh, or am I the okay? What do you do? You don't say, oh, I hate this. Oh, I don't like this. Okay, just swallow, just swallow. No, what do you do? You spit it out. You see, there's some things on a Sunday morning that's made specifically for you and your heart. And there's some things that are going to be said that's not for you, but it's for somebody else. You might not agree 100%. But what we all have to understand is if God called you here, then we've got to rise as one harmonious, one mind headed towards one vision to see the lost become found, to put away the excuses, to put away the self-doubt, to put away the I'm not bold enough, I can't do, and begin to do. Verse 26, and to the end, it says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful ex expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour 
the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. Is the enemy attacking you? Are you facing persecution? Or are you going every single day of your life at ease? When you're facing persecution and when you're having the enemy try to attack you, check it, I know the enemy tries to attack. He attacks because he doesn't want the piano to play. He doesn't want the sound to work properly. He's gonna try to come in and bring agitation and disunity within the body. Because a church without arms becomes very difficult to try to open a door. We are the body. The same trials that cause the religious hypocrites to flee the word is the same trials that strengthen the believer. See, when you're faced with that, when you're faced with persecution, when you're faced with the enemy trying to say, hey, it's not worth going to church this morning. Hey, it's not worth investing time and energy and finances into what God is wanting to do at Grace Bible Church. It's not worth it at all. That should be a sign to you to say, you know what, I'm just going to stay home. No, it should be a sign to you saying, oh man, it's time for me to get up and go to church because God has something and he's going to speak over me. It's in those moments the enemy tries to change your mindset. Because he doesn't want you to learn. He doesn't want you to grow. Luke chapter 8 verse 13 and verse 15 it says, They on the rock are they, which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe. And in time of temptation fall away. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. You might be facing the enemy today. You feel the pressure rising at home. You feel the financial tug of this world. And you might be saying, where are you, God? Where are you, God? And yet look at what it said once more at the very end of verse 15. Having heard the word, keep it. Keep it in remembrance. Keep it it on your fridge. Put verses in your bathroom. Put it on your shower door. Put it on your fridge. Put it on your pantry. Put it on your washer and dryer. So you'll always be reminded. Keep his word and bring forth fruit with patience. You might be feeling dry. You might be saying, Lord, this is all I have. But he's saying, be patient. Keep pursuing me. Keep running. And when you can't run no more, keep on walking. And when you can't walk no more, just take one more step and put another step in front and another step in front and don't stop. 
Have patience, for I'm coming. Verse 33 of Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulation, and partly while you became companions of those who so treaded, for you had compassion on me in my chains and joyful accepted the plundering of your goods knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Hold fast. The promise is coming. The weeding of the crop has only begun. And church, I know it sounds icky, but <laughs> the day we live in is not getting brighter. The darkness is beginning to surround. But it's through our patience and it's through the treading of the water and keep on going. The purpose for the assembly and to use your gift is so someone else can experience Jesus through you. Is, Jesus, is somebody else experiencing Jesus through you? Or are you sitting just saying, God, God, where are you? Where are you? I want you. I want you. And he's saying, I'm waiting for you. You know my word. Get up and do. Step out in faith and watch me move. But until you step up and become bold, you're not going to hear my voice fully. It's time for us to stand and to be bold when the Holy Spirit leads us to be bold. Hebrews chapter 6. It says, and we desire that every one of you do shew the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. In verse 37 of Hebrews chapter 10, we continue to the end. It says, For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. I love what it means in Greek in translation. In translation, it emphasizes the shortness of time. It could be translated of, oh, how little the time is, or, oh, a little while, and Christ that has promised to come will come and will not delay. Can we all stand this morning? As Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 says, We are to enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go and there eat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There is a gate. And I believe that every single one of us are set on the path to that narrow gate. So I want to encourage you today to stay on that narrow gate. Stay on that narrow path. I remember my wife, last story. I remember my wife and I going on a hiking trail. Big, big, big trail. 
we decided to only go the three mile, which was the shortest route. It was for a school project. We had to take pictures of nature and do all this different fun stuff. And, and so we went over, we're taking pictures. And what we didn't realize is that the path went to about four feet in width to about like six inches. It got very narrow. And we were looking down at this point saying, whoa, I don't know where to go. And my wife and I began to worry, are we on the right path? Are we, are we going the right direction? Come to find out, we actually veered from the path. But as long as we stayed on that narrow path that was created, we're gonna get out. You see, sometimes the gates, the path can look very wide. But the day is drawing where the path is getting and it's widowing and it's getting smaller and smaller. Will you be able to distinguish what path you're on? Will you be able to distinguish if it's only a foothold big enough for your foot to take place? Narrow is the gate. Will you know the way when the time draws near? Are you seeking God, saying, God, I want more of you? Last week we asked if your cup wasn't filled to come to the altar and allow him to overflow your cup and have an abundance flow out of you. I pray that your cup was full. And so today I pray that you'll begin to seek God saying, God, what is my purpose? What is my gift? What are you showing me? Show me, Lord, in where I am to be in the assembly of your church. Show me, Lord, what I need to do as an individual. Show me, Lord. I pray that's you today, saying, I want more of you, God. I don't wanna stop at hello. I don't wanna stop at hi, Jesus, I'm the sinner. Thank you, Lord, for listening. I'm going back to my home. Don't stop there. Keep pursuing and keep enduring and keep wanting more and keep fighting. Fight for your brothers and sisters. Fight for your loved ones and fight for the ones that are surrounding you and that are all around you. Be bold and loud for Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed for housing the gift of speaking in tongues. Use it. It is a straight conduit between you and God that the enemy has no idea what you're saying. So begin to speak. Speak in the language he's given you. Speak and use the gift that he has given you. Begin to use the gift because we need more empowered bodies to stand up, to rise up, and to be bold for God once again. So if that's you saying, you know what? It's time. It's time for me to be bold. It's time for me to get out. It's time for me to move. Then as the worship team leads, I'm going to ask you to be getting bold and get out of your seats once more. Get out of your seats and seek God once more, saying, God, I'm not, I'm not done with you, Lord. I need more of you, Lord. I'm fighting, Lord. I'm going to continue knocking, Lord. I'm going to continue enduring. I'm going to continue seeking you. I'm going to continue going after you. And I'm going to continue to keep my eyes on you, Lord. If that's you, will you begin to move? Will you begin to move right now? Right now.
Come on, just press into his presence just for a couple more minutes. Right where you are, will you just begin just to be right where you are and just begin to thank him for everything he has done. Bring thankfulness and gratitude to his name. stand and just worship him on this last song. Bow before your throne and all the elders cast their crown before the Raise your voice. Jesus, we thank you, Lord God. 
Church, we're going to continue just to allow this to, just to continue. But you are more than welcome to stay. You are dismissed. But I pray that you are blessed through today and that God is only empowering you to begin to fulfill the purpose and the gifts that he has planted within you to become forth into what he's going to do. Amen.